This is AV Week, recorded Friday, August 26th, 2011. iPad Bridesmaids. Ready. AV, AV Week. Performing scan. AV Week. Online. This is AV Week. It is time for AV Week, your weekly roundup of news and commentary. I'm your host, Tim Albright. With us today, we have Dawn Mead. She is known as AV Dawn. She's an AV consultant and also part of Gary Cave's Rave Blog Squad. Hello, Dawn. Hi. Uh, also with us is Rich uh, Fergoza. Uh, Richard is the owner of R.A. Fergoza Electronic Interiors. He is in Silicon Valley, so he's in the midst of of all the really smart people. Hello, Richard. How you doing? And also with us uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, his name is Philip Cordell. He's known as Hi-Fi. It's the A- it's theavprofessional.com. Hello, Phil. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, real quickly, we'll, we'll, we'll punt this off with Richard. Uh, earlier this week, uh, one of the most powerful and influential technologists of our time and, and quite possibly arguably ever, uh, Igni- uh, said that he is stepping down as CEO of Apple. That would be one Mr. Steve Jobs. Richard, what does this mean not only for technology in, in general, but also, you know, kind of as, a, as an extension because um, Apple has a relationship with, with Savant and they're building a brand new uh, facility. What does this mean for the AV industry and technology as a whole? Well, I kept waiting for uh, iPhones across the world to uh, emit a, a white puff of smoke, kind of as if the, uh, the Pope died <laughs> as soon as the resignation was announced. Uh, you know, turtlenecks and a turtleneck procession down one infinite loop right. here in Cupertino. Um, you know, I think in terms of the, the AV industry right now, I, it, it's not going to affect us. What, what it is going to do is potentially change people's view of the cult of personality revolving around Steve Jobs. I mean, he is in some very rarefied air. He's a celebrity, excuse me, a celebrity CEO. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, Apple has a roadmap and, and Tim Cook has been, you know, handling the day-to-day operations since January um, at this point. And in terms of the ripple effect, we're not going to see it. I don't think for a, a couple of years at this point. Um, the initial scare um, makes people wonder what direction are they going to go in. But the, the company itself uh, you know, is pretty pervasive at this point. I mean, they, they've made tech sexy. Well, is that because of lead time of products? And I'm not a manufacturer, so I, I have a basic understanding of this. Is that because it takes so long for a product to get from uh, concept to actual you know, manufacturing and delivery? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you're, you're probably figuring that they have, you know, designs for the iPad 3 and the iPhone 6 probably already in the can uh, at this point. What we're seeing is, you know, products that are being about to be released out of production at this point. So in terms of your, your manufacturing cycle, uh, you know, your marketing, you know, just getting all of your teams together, uh, there's there there's quite a bit that you, you have to figure that they've got uh, planned and and it's not like uh, you know he just walked in one day and said I resign. Yeah. This was not just a an abrupt move. This had to be uh, uh, you know discussed internally for some for some period of time. Philip, what do you see uh, Steve Jobs' impact and and the fact that he's leaving now um, on technology as a whole and and the and the AV industry. I'm sorry. Who is who is this Steve Jobs character we're talking about? No, I mean you he, he know he made I a think, computer called the Lisa a few years uh, ago. I've heard of that. No man. I mean, as a figurehead, you know, it's it's certainly the passing of an era. But I, as was mentioned by Richard, I mean, I think they've got an excellent roadmap laid out. I know their stock prices weren't really that shaken uh, by the announcement because people have faith in in what they do. Their contribution to design, I think, is is beyond words almost. I mean, it's just awesome what they've done, taking, you know, these clunky boxes that we had for years and really streamlined them. Um, so, you know, I think I think it's going to take a little getting used to for us to see somebody else out there jumping around on stage, rolling out products. But uh, but as far as, as tech goes, man, I think I think they've got it rolling. I'm not too worried about 
what's going to happen, uh, you know, with, with losing Steve Jobs, quite frankly. Don, are you worried about the, the, the missing, you know, the missing figurehead doing anything? Because th- there's some, there is something to be said for his vision and the way that the AV industry has kind of grasped and, and, and grafted themselves onto his vision. I mean, we, we have, uh, in my opinion, one of the sexiest, uh, least expensive touch panels when it comes to control, and that's an iPad. It's not ne- anything that, that AMX or Crestron controlled or created. Well, agree, agreed. The iPad is, is a fantastic, low-cost, you know, sexy interface for our control systems. But, you know, the iPad wasn't entirely Steve Job, Jobs. I mean, ne- neither was Apple or Macintosh. I mean, yeah. he's always worked with partners. He's just been the guy standing up in front getting all the accolades. Um, I, I honestly don't think it's going to have as big an impact as the press might be hyping it. Um, Tim Cook, the gentleman that got promoted from chief operating officer to CEO, he's actually been running the company since January, according to the LA Times. Uh, Steve stepped back in January for the day-to-day operations. Um, Tim has also run the company in 2004 and 2009 when Steve was ill the first few times and had to take medical leave. So I think the the company is in great hands. Tim Cook has experience running it. He's worked hand in hand with Steve. Steve's not going away. He's become the chairman of the board. He's staying on the board. He's just not going to be there every day in day-to-day operations. And I mean, Apple, I, I will say this, as a company, they're doing a fantastic job with writing, planning, and sticking to a plan for contingency, for continuation. Mm -hmm. Um, Too many companies don't think about what happens if our CEO or our president or our chief engineer or whatever dies or quits or, you know, just goes insane and doesn't come to work for, you know, eight months. (laughs) And, And realistically, you know, companies, even little ones, even when I was a small business owner, we had to have a plan and try to stick to it. And kudos to Apple for doing that. I think it's just going to keep on going on. So Steve's going to take a vacation and everything's going to be fine. I think, I, that, I think so. That, that's the general consensus we've got. Okay. Um, from the world of Commercial Integrator, the magazine, the nine essential, according to them, apps for projector installs. And this comes on the store on, on the heels of a story uh, from Pacific Media Associates. They're projecting that the front projector market is going to grow from 8.5 million units uh, to about 39 million units in 2015 um first of all um phil do you do you use um apps for when you when you're doing installs and if so do any of these apps make sense to you you know i checked them out i currently don't use any uh there's some pretty hip apps though man a little bit of redundancy there were like four or five different lens calculator apps you know i mean i don't need four or five tape measures but that's okay i I know how that rolls uh people are going to be competing for uh for the apps that you're going to want, when you're going to need. Uh, truthfully, I just need an app that will pull cable for me. I didn't see that on the list. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, through science and technology, I feel like one day we'll get there. The Stud Finder app, that looks super cool. You know, I'm not sure exactly how that works. I'm sure I could find out. But that, to me, w- was pretty neat. But, um, you know, as far as lens calculations go, we've been doing that sort of thing for years on our own. It's nice to be able to streamline everything into one device, get all that info, you know, anywhere you're at. Well, didn't you know that Apple released the uh, the iCable uh, right before Jobs resigned? It's uh, you know wireless HDMI, Bluetooth, and invisible uh, over uh, you know a hundred meters. That's what Thunderbolt so. is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say this. I, you know, I personally haven't been out in the field doing installs in a while. I've done one or two in my career just to make sure I know what the heck I'm selling and you know what my guys are doing, but. Um, these are useful apps to a point. They're all i apps, yeah. which that's fantastic if you have an iPad or an iPhone or an iPod Touch. For those of us that are Android people, not so helpful. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is I'm, I'm just stunned at the statistic that they think front projection is going to grow so rapidly, seeing as how over the past five to ten years of my career, our front projection has shrunk dramatically. Um, you know, awesome if it happens. I love the projector companies, Christie Digital Projection, all of those guys, a lot of friends at them and, you know, I've sold a lot of them over my career. But the very fact is, you know, my numbers in, in when I was still with an integrator 
on projectors has been dropping. So hmm. I don't know how useful some of those apps would be, you know, as we go to a more flat panel world. Well, well d- wouldn't wh- go ahead, Tim. go ahead, Richard. Wouldn't one consider though that in the umbrella of projectors, you're also going to be dealing with the Pico projectors? Um, Forward thinking to they're trying to you know create these units inside the phone in classroom applications, tiny, tiny units. So the conversation about projectors that we've had for the past 10 years, and I, I dealt with you know nine inch CRT tubes and double and triple stacks. You know, these these were right. behemoths that took an experienced professional to to hook up and calibrate and maintain and the cost that came along with it as opposed to now as an example my wife teaches uh at a charter school in inner city oakland every classroom is equipped with a, an lcd projector mm-hmm. right. and so you know are they big ticket items uh, any longer? No, they're commoditized at this point. They're becoming right. personal use devices where people can realistically throw them in a bag or in a backpack, pull them out, and do a presentation. I I, I think that's where the numbers are coming from. It's 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 a matter of quantifying the numbers as to wh- what these devices are, as opposed to having a conversation of what we've expected them to be. Right, and 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 that's a great point with the Pika projectors and and the personal use. Um, and, and in those instances, I would absolutely say, you know, hey, if you've got a Pico projector, especially one on your phone, just have the app so you know how far to put it back and, you know, that sort of thing. But your average Joe user isn't going to know throw and distance brightness and all of that. I mean, they, they just make it look good. They don't deal with the math. In fact, unfortunately, some integrators don't even <laughs> deal with the math. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, in an ideal world, we would educate anyone that buys a projector enough that they would want and use an app like this and, you know, have perfect projection. Unfortunately, you know, we're humans, so that doesn't happen. No, it, it doesn't. But th- there is one thing, back, back to you guys' point about the, the saturation. I kind, I kind of see this in the education world where th- this year um, a number of project, projector manufacturers came out with uh, – Sub thousand dollar, and actually the the Epson had on their Bright Futures, and I don't understand how all that works. Uh, pricing was under seven hundred dollars for an HDMI HDCP compatible projector, widescreen. It was like twenty six hundred lumens. That right there gets you everything you need for a modern day classroom. Now I don't I don't know how I don't know how the these guys are saying up to thirty nine million dollars because that's an awful lot. Of sub thousand dollar projectors, <laughs> I mean, right. it, it just is. I mean, the, I, I don't know that there, there's, that there's that many classrooms out there that don't have them, unless they're planning on you know, you have you have an install that was done four or five or six years ago, and you're going to you know refresh the entire building. So I don't know. Well, take into account too, you know, not to say that any of us have uh, any ulterior motives, but what's the upside? to promoting <laughs> numbers like that as well. You know, there, there's, there's a bit of a rah-rah hope that, uh, you know, if we say that we're going to sell 39 million projectors, well, hopefully somebody's going to buy them. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> right, self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think there were numbers not to get too off subject, but they had the same talk about uh, home automation reaching, uh, you know, $6 billion or something by yeah. 2016. Uh, how much of that is not going to be you know, Comcast and Verizon and everybody else? It's, it's a matter of looking at, you know, there, there's, a, there's a large number that we all fall in love with. And then we have to look at the trickle down, especially for people who are integrators or uh, people who are actually in the business of selling these devices. How many are they actually going to sell in order to keep it themselves in business as opposed to being part of a press release? Well, is this is this more of a raw raw for projector manufacturers, or is it a raw raw for integrator, integrators? You'd, you'd have to ask the writer at that point. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm reticent to, uh, to 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 comment on that one. <laughs> Understood. All right. Um, from the world of CE Pro, uh, retrofit activity is increasing twenty three percent, and apparently, this is a record level. Another rah-rah, I guess. Uh, In a sign that continues to bode well for integrators focusing on the existing home and retrofit market, remodeling activity by U.S. homeowners hit a record level in June, up 23% over last year and up for the 20th month in a row. 
Philip, is this something more of a, a comment on the fact that new home sales are in the tank and so people are, are staying put and just upgrading what they're in? I think that's certainly what it points to, man. Um, you know, and I do pretty much strictly commercial installations, but uh, but I think I mean, it makes perfect financial sense. If you're going to stay put in your home, you may as well start adding value to it and make it into the home of your dreams, you know? And so people are going to pull the permits and hopefully do that right and hopefully call us in or call, you know, somebody in our industry in there to get in there and put in a good quality system for them. And, uh, and so, yeah, you know, I think that certainly speaks to kind of where the housing market is at right now. And, uh, you know, I personally am fine with retrofits, but I, I kind of prefer new construction. Well, yes. Be because, yeah, you get in there, you, you got your run of the place, there's different hoops to jump through, you know, but uh, you don't have somebody breathing down your neck, so... Well, let me ask a, a, a question from someone who's not an integrator, and that would be me, to either you or, or, or Richard. Is it easier and is it more profitable to do a retrofit, or is it more profitable to do new construction? It is retrofit. A, a lot of what I do when I consult with integrators is I, I try to always reinforce the fact with them that there are more people living in their homes currently than there are people building homes. Mm -hmm. The retrofit market is going to allow you to pay your insurance premiums, keep gas in the trucks of, of your employees, and keep your your cash flow going. It's, it's an important segment to maintain because these are your clients. These are going to be your referral base. And uh, you know, the, the, the new construction market, especially during the 90s, everybody loved it. As Philip said, it's easier. You know, you, you have free run of the place. The walls are open. You can also tap from a different labor pool for new construction than you have to tap into if you're dealing with existing structures and, and a retrofit market. It, it's, it, it's a different skill set altogether because you do have to have some basics of, of, of construction uh, details to, to, to work through when you are, um, you know, drilling blind or pulling blind. Uh, and and you know hopefully you're not just taking a, a point and pray approach you know when you're when you're getting from one side of a house to another uh, and uh, you know there there's the, the beauty of new construction that everybody loves is that they you know they can sell this integrated system and and they can sell a big ticket item or you know all of the the the, the desires they have for you know the magazine spread or, or anything else and retrofit's not sexy but retrofit pays the bills. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, but invariably, that swear word will come out in retrofit, and that is owner-furnished equipment. Oh. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I've done a, a segment on my side about uh, the last touch rule, man. They're, they're going to give you something that they swear works. It will not work for you, and then it is your problem. You know, that, that always happens. Um, so that's why I, I'm a fan of the new construction, because everything's fresh out of the box, under warranty. And if it doesn't work, I know who to call, and I'm not arguing with my customer about whose responsibility it is that their real-to-real -real player no longer works, you know? Um, you mean you, you can't right. fix those? <laughs> I've got a pretty broad skill set, but that is not within it. If, if you if you can fix those, come see me because I have a couple, so. All right. Yeah. But, but the, truth, the truth of the matter is, whether you're in commercial or residential, everybody prefers a fresh build because, like you said, everything's fresh out of the box. You get to run when the walls are open. You don't have to deal with what on earth is that? There's a fire block there. What, you know, but it, like you said, it pays the bills. More people are staying put. Um, you know, I know my husband and I put the AV in our house. We had a nightmare of a time getting through the walls and, you know, we're not resi people. We do, but we do installs for commercial and, it's always a challenge. It's always fun. It's always a surprise when you do retrofits. Um, I, 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 it's challenging, but I, I think a company that can do retros and new builds, they're, they're set. They're gold, you know? It, to, to add to it, I think any company that's currently planning on new construction or spec to be their primary business model, um, they're not going to be around for a period of time. I mean, we are still dealing with um, some significant economic ripple effects coming throughout. I mean, I'm in the heart of the Silicon Valley, and uh, you know, we're we're California's pretty hard hit. We we've got people who are losing 30, 40 percent of value 
on eight hundred nine hundred two million dollar houses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're we, we have a saying here in the Silicon Valley that if you're in the low six figures, you're making Silicon Valley min- minimum wage. Oh, uh, <laughs> and and so there's a, a slight difference here in in the Bay Area just because of our overall cost of living, and and in major metropolitan areas, one thing to consider is there's no land. You're you're not going to build a new building in in downtown Manhattan. Yeah. You're not going to build a new building in downtown San Francisco. There is no place for you to go. So if you're in a metropolitan area, you are going to be looking for that client base who you you can deal with. And and more importantly, I think, uh, you know, if there's there is the side of the service element, which is many companies talk about customer service and wanting to be able to go above and beyond. If you truly want to live by your motto, retrofit allows you to actually create potentially a client for life because you are fixing a problem. And then you are delivering, uh, you know, an end result where, uh, you know, in, in, in the new construction, and you've got a little bit of room to, to fiddle around with it. Well, and, and, and to that, you know, we, we talked a few weeks ago with, with, with George Tucker, and he was mentioning, you know, the, these smaller in, in, entry-level systems. Is this kind of the same thing where, you know, right now, yeah, I, I may have lost 10, 20, 30 percent on my house, and so I'm going to stay where I am. But you know what? The, the, the economy is not – going to be in the tank forever and so maybe in a few years in, in four or five years once the economy rebounds i am going to be looking to either you know, build again or um i'm going to be looking to you know c- contact you again for another installation absolutely and uh you know the the the, the best uh you know is it uh uh i believe uh, one of the writers uh, wrote a great article a couple of months ago about his quote unquote, his best friends. And his best friends were um, two file cabinets, his client file cabinets uh, that he pulled out and, and contacted clients as part of that upgrade. You know, the, the, the integrator that's going to survive um, is going to be the integrator that is looking at the clients they already have or the buildings that already exist. And if by chance a new construction project comes along or a university or a corporate boardroom, that just helps you pack the pipeline for the next 12 to 18 months um, on the way through. And and so, you know, it's, again, talking about people are staying put. Uh, if you're not focusing on the retrofit market or developing the tools on how to, uh, you know, make that a revenue stream, it, it's slim pickings because everybody's looking for that new construction job. So so your competition level has, ri- has, has risen as well. You've got resi going into commercial and commercial going into resi. Yeah. You know, there is no project that's safe anymore. Um, you've got people- <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, it's the sharks and jets of AV. You know, da-da, and, da-da, da-da. and you're a jet. And you're don't, a jet. Even, <laughs> don't even get me started on the IT guys and the security guys. That's a oh. whole other ball game. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and let's also take, you know, in consideration that we all believe that our quote unquote artistry is what separates us from everybody else. Security people, electricians, these are also comp- competent tradespeople as well. I wouldn't necessarily go out and do electrical, but I have an electrical license. Uh, you know, I understand that industry. And to poo-poo them as saying, you know, they're, they're not going to come in there. There's, you know, some of the top Crestron dealers, I think, in the past decade started out as security dealers. Wow. You know, why? Because they have the base. You know, the, these, are, these are trades that we can't take lightly uh, at this point. You know, they are competent companies that are coming through as well. We just always want to affix a stigma to them that, you know, gosh, they don't know what they're doing because I've been doing AV for 21 years like myself. Uh, you know, times change. Well, and it's something that, that has been written about and spoken about in, 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 uh, ad nauseum, but it is the whole thing about, about converging between IT and AV, not between, but t- together. Um, I was talking to someone a, a few weeks ago about, you know, security issues and as all of these systems start more and more living on networks, we have bigger, bigger and bigger security issues. And nothing against the, the AV industry, but there, there seems to be at least um, an incredible lack of, of knowledge when it comes to living in the IT world where th- we're giving them that it's again it's, hopefully it's, i'm not coming across as you know us versus them but we're, we're kind of giving the it industry an opening here where we're not you know we're not educating ourselves enough 
to um, to solve some of these problems that these guys have been solving for years. Right. Well, oh. at, you know, in, in truth, just as it's naive for a company to say, I'm only going to do consumer or, I mean, residential and I'm only going to do commercial or I'm only going to do retros or I'm only going to do new builds. It's naive at this point for an integrator in our industry to say, I'm not going to have an IT guy on staff. Yeah. I'm not going to have a security guy on staff. I'm not going to have somebody with this skill set. And the fact that we are not having these people on staff and the IT companies are bringing in the AV staff members and the AV trained personnel, that's where we're having you know the disconnect. So I think if we do a better job at educating our own companies and bringing in people from these, they are very valid trades, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and we wouldn't do, be able to do anything without them. But it, it, it's, it's that mindset of, oh, God, even more competition for these five jobs in our region. Twelve more industries just moved in to try to compete for those jobs. Yeah. <laughs> it, can be, it can be disconcerting. But we, we do as an industry have to recognize that we need those skills and people trained in those trades in our stable, so to speak. Well, we do. The, 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 one of the first classes I ever went to with a, with a control manufacturer – um, it was one of those things where you, you go to the class for two or three days, and I was in class with a guy who was Cisco certified. Um, at the time, this was many years ago, at the time, I was a little taken aback. I'm like, why, why are you here? And he's like, well, you know, this, that, and the other. And this guy knew, knew you know, he could probably build a router, you know, in it blindfolded, you know, in his sleep. And he's expa- explaining to me how this control company and, and, and security and, and all this stuff is kind of just working together. And, and he worked for an AV integrator. It wasn't, you know, an IT company. He had been hired specifically for his skill set. So there was an AV and, integrator who was a little more forward thinking, saying, yes, we need people like this on staff. And kudos to them. Yeah. That's- and, you know, shameless plug for you here, Tim, um, your podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, was phenomenal talking about this in terms of, you know, the AV industry and certification and competing certs and mm-hmm. not having, you know, any specific route for AV necessarily to uh, police themselves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, whereas with, you know, security and IT, there is, there's established standards. Yes. And so, you know, a Cisco certification means something. Yeah. To an average consumer, a CTS is just an acronym. So, uh, you know, there, there's absolutely a need to, you know, if, if at the very least, if you're not going to bring somebody on staff, maybe you're too small, you don't have enough jobs to bring in, find a local partner, mm-hmm. um, you know, find a way that, you know, if there is a project that if that's what makes you valuable to the project, uh, you know, as a liaison, as, as an asset, that's where you build the goodwill at that point, which is, you know, no, it, rather than the standard, well, we don't do IT. If I'm an IT guy, if the answer becomes, I don't do IT, but I have a group of people who we've worked with closely for X amount of years, that we work in tandem to provide a unified solution, all of a sudden you stop being a problem again and you start becoming, uh, you know, part of getting the project done. And, and people appreciate that. Well, and no. it's no different, and I'm, I'm sure that, that this is not unique. I have a friend of mine who has a small family-owned AV company here in St. Louis, and they, they do broadcasts and stuff like that. But they have a partner. Now, there's nothing in writing, but it's, it's a relationship they've had over the years uh, of, of electrical contractor. And this, the, uh, especially for, for instances where um, union uh, labor is required and stuff like that, the, the, these guys have gone back and forth. And any time that, that the AV company needs uh, union labor to pull cable and, and make ends, the electric the electrician is called anytime the the EC needs AV done. He calls the AV contractor. So it it, it is a is some a, 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 a symbiotic relationship. And and so what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is develop that type of relationship with IT companies. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And and there's lots of great companies who are out there who also become your inroad because yeah. if they decide that you know it's it's a keep your friends close and your enemies closer <laughs> in some respects, in that if you become an outlet for the IT person and you build a relationship, they're less likely to decide to want to compete with you yeah. because you're both on a project and focusing on your strengths. As opposed to saying, "Well, gosh, I need to fill in this hole," you, you know, it 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 winds up being self defeating at that point. Yeah, it does. It does. 
Agreed. I mean, as a, again, as a former small business owner, joint ventures are your best friend. There are so many times going into government jobs, just for the sheer size of things, we would partner up with an electrical company, um, an IT company, even another small AV company. And when you put together these teams of professionals that work together and work well together, you do foster that goodwill. People work together in future projects. They'll call us. We'll call them. I mean, if, if you're not AVISPL, <laughs> joint venture is your best friend. Well, it is because nobody, I mean, it, it, nobody does everything perfectly. You know, no, nobody right. has all the strengths. Um, you know, regardless of if it's, it's me or, or you guys, you know, whatever it is that we do in, in life, I don't know everything. It's one thing I keep trying to teach my five-year-old. You don't know everything, <laughs> you know, because everything I tell her, I know, I know. So, yeah, that's a whole other issue. Um, <laughs> my, my one-year-old just yells at me and then walks away. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> That's awesome. And then goes and plays on his iPad. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Steve Jobs. And, and, pro- and he's probably programming a, a, uh, an app. He, uh, yeah, the uh, there was there was a you got to be kidding me moment when he opened up the iPad about three months ago and started playing his peekaboo game and uh, <laughs> you know there's there the, the you know technologically speaking I mean the, these kids are so advanced you know my the backhanded compliment I got yesterday from my mom was uh, you know you're really smart but you're the village idiot compared to him at this age. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That hurts, Mom. Well, yeah, thanks, Mom. And here's Appreciate the thing. I, I, I've reached the point where I feel like my father did 20 years ago when I was the one programming the VCR. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and my kid now is, is doing the, the – the, uh, both of them are, are playing on my Android phone and you know, figuring out things I never knew existed. So, And if they can terminate Cat 5 and Cat 6, they can do IT or AV. Exactly. So there, there's nothing, there is no better attic crawler than a toddler. Trust me. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, but those those pesky child labor laws keep getting in the way. What child labor laws? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> he's eating jelly beans. He's happy. There's some really small crawl spaces. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> oh man. Uh, let's move on before I get in trouble. Uh, from Gary K and the Rave Publications. Uh, City Group and Sunjevity create fun for residential solar projects. Um, nothing against City Group or Sunjevity. Briefly, here it is. Uh, what they've created is a fifty million dollar new residential solar lease project. They want you to put your AV system on solar panels. Anybody up for this, Philip? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, and I don't know a ton about solar. I know that it's been around. For years, you know, since the seventies or whatever, um, I just don't know that I'm ready to commit to to setting up a, a client, you know, with uh, with solar. I think it's a great added revenue stream, you know, for what we do. But you know, it's probably just my fear of getting out into the unknown. You know, that's probably all it is. I think uh, I I love the the move towards sustainable energy, and uh, and I know solar is a a great way to power things. But in terms of me selling that to a client, I personally don't know quite enough about it just yet to make that pitch. Well, and and Don, can you? I mean, I, I couldn't successfully or or with good conscience suggest to an end user or even to a, a client that I'm consulting to go with the a, a technology that I know runs off the sun. And so, am I silly in that, or am you know am I missing something? I don't think it's silly. I, I kind of see both sides of this issue. First of all, when I shared this link with my husband, who is an AV engineer and design engineer uh, for a government contractor, his first words out of his mouth were, no way, because I don't <laughs> spec things that won't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh. so the, the the first response is cynicism that, you know, oh, it's not going to work at night. It's not going to work when it's cloudy. A lot of the sun technology has improved. I, I have some friends here in Maryland who have the solar panels on their roofs and they love it because it's the house still runs regular electric, but when the sun's out and shining, they harness that instead of paying a utility company. Uh, so I see where that could be a very good thing as a also add if you're interested, you know, some of these companies and, and houses that are looking for the LEED certification, uh, you know, or all those super green type people this is definitely something to mention to them. Now, on the other hand, you know, I trust the tried and true. I like, you know, paying my electric bill and having power that just happens. Um, 
So, you know, I see both sides. I, I, I will definitely be bringing it up if I can do a little plug here. September 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern time is the AV chat. If you're on Twitter, mm-hmm. the Green Tech Open Mic is the topic that day on September 15th. And when we have the Green Tech conversation on AV chat, I will definitely be bringing up this article. But, um, uh, you know, for recommending to my customers, eh, it depends. If they're definitely going for the lead certifications, I'll mention it. If they really don't care and just want stuff that works, it, it's not worth it. Yeah. R- Richard, I'm going to say three letters to you when it comes to sun panels and, and, and solar panels and, and photovoltaic um, technology. R O I. Um, it, we're in California, and we're in the Silicon Valley. Just to give you an idea, um, the, uh, the this company, their new headquarters is 15 minutes from me, so I'm actually going to pay them a visit um, just to see what Synergy is really doing um, out here. Uh, personal experience, um, you know, I know in my neighborhood, we probably got about 40% uh, you know, solar panel penetration. I, I run an $800 to $900 electric bill in my place at times. Uh, just because of the sheer amount of electronic equipment that I have in here, because you know I've turned my house into my lab. Um, is there options for it for an integrator? Again, partnering. I think that if you can become a a you know find a local solar company who you can partner with, um, does it lead inroads for you? Yeah. Why? Power conditioning. Um, you know, battery backup. You know, all of the non-sexy items that can be sold through that are profit centers for integrators absolutely absolutely those are those are things that are available to you you know are you going to hire three guys to with ladders and trucks to go up on a roof um you know and, and install <laughs> these things and and you know connect to the high voltage no probably not unless you know you absolutely you know, you know couldn't you know you, you were made an offer you couldn't refuse but uh you know as an add-on sale oh absolutely you know, to be able to go in and, you know, sell, uh, uh, you know, what, what is it, the blue, the blue bolts, the new managed blue bolts um, electrical, to be able to monitor consumption. Uh, you know, the, the natural progression is you've done solar, you've got these components on here, let's talk about your actual consumption. Let's talk about ways that we can maximize your ROI <laughs> on these panels uh, over the life of the system. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think, I, you know, again, personally, I, I really feel that in this climate, there aren't any opportunities that you shouldn't at least do your due diligence on and and talk to somebody about to see if it's available to you. That makes sense. Here, here. Did did you say forty percent saturation for for solar panels? In my neighborhood, yeah. Holy cow! Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I I, I live in a in a, a small pocket um, about twenty miles outside of San Francisco proper, and my neighborhood is you know. 100 year old trees which is old for, <laughs> for okay, our part of the country <laughs> uh <laughs> but uh you know on on one block you know there's maybe seven or eight houses you know in a two block radius um you know four of them have have solar i mean i'm, I'm doing it next next summer i'm i'm glad about this just for the subsidies yeah uh because i you know again like you said is that you know when the sun is is shining you're storing up this power um, and if you're over, the, a lot of the times with the utilities, you can sell back to your to utility. So depending on, you know, what region that you're in, uh, you know, this thing does truly quickly pay for itself. And, you know, being green and lead certified. And, and for me, you know, now having two small children, being a little bit kinder, you know, in my earthy, crunchy way to give my kids something <laughs> back. <laughs> uh, you know, instead of being a shameless consumer of of all of our resources, you know, conserving something so that my one-year-old, you know, isn't walking around in a bubble suit 40 years from now. Yeah. It's just a matter of time before we all view the sun as a massive scorching UPS. <laughs> <laughs> well, F- Philip, is, is this something that, that would be interesting or at least um, considerable for, for uh, commercial? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as was mentioned, the reliability issues are really what need to be worked out. You know, and I, I have issues as it is with things coming bad out of the box. The last thing I need is, you know, is the total power source or you know some component to fail. And I think that's, I mean, that's always the hump that that new technology has to get over. Is it's got to be proven. Well, how do you prove it without people trying it? Well, 
I think that's being tested pretty well in the residential market. And and I I actually have been on one uh, natural gas commercial install, a new plant here in Nashville that was LEED certified. And they did uh, a ton of solar stuff, and and they hadn't had any issues with it. Hmm. So you know, I, I do think it's just a matter of time. But as of today, where I'm at, it's still it's still a little further off in the distance. So I've got a quick question: Is is you know, I'm in a metropolitan area, obviously, and, and so I have less experience with, um, you know, less populated areas of the country, you know, the Midwest and the South. And it, it, do you guys think that it's more of a regional thing that we're, because we consume energy a little bit differently in, you know, New York and L.A. and San Francisco, et cetera, that, you know, maybe we're we're just trying to find ways to cut our power bills because we're getting absolutely taxed over it. No, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 I mean our, our, our electricity costs, will, you know, help bankrupt our state. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think the answer to that question is right in the article here from Rave that Sungevity is starting in eight states, Arizona, California, <laughs> Colorado, yep. Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, and New York. I mean, look at the, look at the states they're, they're focusing on and look at where the population centers are you know it's it's we're massive consumers of electricity in these areas just for the sheer number of people and so i think that's a a big reason that they're aiming there i don't know i'm sure there are are very green-minded people in iowa for instance that also use a lot of power but i i don't see them rushing to get the technology there at this point well and some of it go ahead phil I say of the eight, those are some pretty uh, progressive states. So I'm sure there are some kind of sociopolitical ideas at the uh, state legislative level. That is, are that maybe... your, is that your kind way of calling us hippies? No, no. <laughs> I'm saying I identify very well, but living here in Tennessee, you know, you just don't see as many uh, solar panels out here. As one so, what is it? Sociopolitically correct individuals in our state? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying there's, there's some social and some political... Uh, sway that's happening out there on the west coast and in some of the, the larger uh concentration areas with population that that we just don't get out here and, and as was mentioned some of the smaller more rural states nashville is pretty hip but the rest of our state uh parts of it are, are still pretty rural well and it, it is somewhat of a sensibilities uh i'm in st louis and so it's it, it's kind of a, a different mindset of of the population and nothing against um, the people in the Midwest, and nothing against the people in the West or the East or even in the South. But it, it is a, a certain um, attitude of, you know, we're, we're kind of laid back. Our, our power bills are not in the 800 or $1,000 uh, range. And so maybe it's, it's a combination of kind of our more conservative um, attitude and coupled with the fact that, you know, we're not facing $1,000 a month uh, power bills. I think once we get there, kind of uh, go back to the um, to the the uh, gasoline. You know, once gasoline hits five or ten dollars a gallon, people are going to start looking for electrical electric cars. Once we start facing thousand and two thousand dollar a month power bills for a fifteen hundred two thousand square foot house, I think everybody in the Midwest is going to be looking for everything that they can do, whether that's solar panels or, or natural gas or what have you. Yeah, and our minimum wage is much closer to the high 90 Gs than up into the six (laughs) figures. So it's a totally different perspective, you know? That is true. Um, this comes... Well, 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 you know, we'll we'll just be sure to send you more rap and hip-hop your way, Philip, right? Ayo! We we would appreciate that. (laughs) Uh, this is a kind of a heartwarming, sad story, but 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 heartwarming nonetheless. Uh, from commercial integrator, a uh, cancer-stricken mom uh, was able to attend her daughter's wedding uh, via video conferencing. Um, the the bride's name was was Ashley, um, and she was set to get married. Found out that her mom was was terminally ill with cancer. Um, then uh, the uh, the bride used Skype uh, to bring her mom into the wedding. Um, Don, you have a couple more examples of how video conferencing and, and is, is, be, is, is being brought more into our everyday lives. It, it really is changing the world. Um, I personally went to high school with a guy. He's actually in the AV industry, but after being in the military, he settled in Melbourne, Australia, way the heck down over there on the other down side of the this. planet. Uh, he works for Durham AV, plug for them, but, um... His family makes, you know, a once every couple of decades trip back home to visit. 
Well, his 20 year high school reunion was about a month ago and they actually had a laptop in the corner at the restaurant where the reunion was that they called Gep's Corner and everyone that went <laughs> over there could could video conference with with Gep and say how you doing and talk to him and see how he was and so he was able to be part of the reunion with the rest of the class even though he's on the far side of the planet um the the best though and and I found this online the other day after seeing this article about the cancer mom and attending her daughter's wedding the best is there is actually a woman who one of her bridesmaids was an iPad. Her brides, <laughs> her, her, her bridesmaid couldn't make it. <laughs> she actually, from, from what it looks like on the video on YouTube, she was wearing the bridesmaid dress with all the others. I mean, she went to fitting, she got the dress, and then ended up being in the wrong part of the country and couldn't get to the wedding. So they had her video conference in. They had her on an iPad. The groomsman that was her partner for the rehearsal and everything carried the iPad. And, you know, if, if you YouTube iPad bridesmaid, you can see the whole story. And, it, I mean, it's amazing. You know, she was able to be there for her best friend since childhood. Her best friend had her there at her wedding. And it was all possible thanks to technology that, you know, a few years ago, it would have been heartbreaking that – your mom's sick or she had to work and couldn't be there. Now it, it really is bringing the world together. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think what we're going to see is more and more stories of this, uh, uh, people being able to use the technology and, and catching up, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, that was the concept of the video phone. You know, grandparents could see their kids from 3,000 miles away. And, you know, I know in my family, we, we do, you know, uh, Skype conferences two to three times a week. Uh, you know, my son recognized his grandparents when we showed up, uh, you know, 3,000 miles away, because he sees them on Skype yeah. a, a couple of times a week. Uh, so you are able to maintain or build family bonds through it. And, and as the technology allows you to do it as simple as picking up a phone, you know, as, as uh, ubiquitously as that, um, yeah, I think these stories are, are fantastic. I mean, that, that's the whole point of tech. You know, that's the whole thing that the whole dream sometimes that is a bit sold is, is about connecting with people and, you know, creating memories with it as opposed to it being the blinking, you know, 12 o'clock VCR that everybody was always scared of. <laughs> um, so I, uh, speaking of family, I have to take my leave and uh, dash off to the airport. Uh, thanks for having me on. It was uh, a lot of fun. I look forward to seeing hopefully some of you at uh, trade events in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Richard. Richard Fergoza. He is from uh, R.A. Fergoza Electronic Interiors. Have a safe trip, Richard. Thanks Cheers, much. Richard. Bye, Bye, guys. Richard. Uh, with that, we're going to do one, one uh, last quick story. Um, Intel um, is recruiting sci-fi writers, and I'm not asking you to to come up with a science fiction story, uh, but this is where I'll go with that. The collection is called uh, The Tomorrow Project, where Intel is asking people to write short stories into what they see in the future. Um, I just read a, a sci-fi classic called uh, The Moat in God's Eye. Uh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with that. Um, yes. Well, in in the story, they're they're referencing handheld pocket computers. This is in the 70s. And so what I want you two to do is, uh, Don, we'll start with you. Uh, give me your what you kind of see or would like to see as far as AV technology in five or ten years. Well, you know, that's that's a really great question. Uh, the, the one thing that I'm looking forward to in the future tech and it's something that we've been talking about now for five, ten years maybe since I first heard of the concept is I just can't wait for those thin, flexible, lightweight OLED mm. panels. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just this week, some one of the companies came out in the news that said they're not going to use OLED in their flat panels, which kind of broke my heart. But – you know, five or five or six, however many years ago, you know, these stories were coming out of Japan that they're coming out with these flexible, lightweight, roll it up, you know, mm-hmm. plasma screen type things, and and the technology is slowly growing. It's slowly coming out, but I would just love that. You know, when you move, just peel your screen off the wall or just stick a new one to the to the other wall. And the mount manufacturers wouldn't <laughs> love it, no. but you know, a little bit of sticky tape and you're good to go. But I think that sort of thing, lightweight, flexible, portable, but just giving us all we have with our giant, you know, 50 to 100 inch flat panels, that would be awesome. Well, yeah, and you put them wherever you wanted to. Exactly. Philip, look into your crystal ball, if you would, and, and give me a five or 10 year down the road, 
what you want to see or what you do see? Well, man, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that everything's going to be networked. Uh, it's all going to be interdependent. You can you can check up on anything in your home from anywhere, um, and that's just how it's going to be. You know, that to me really does look like the future. And wireless, you know, everything's going to be wireless, uh, and, and it's going to be smaller, obviously. But the uh, wireless power, uh, I think, is pretty pretty neat. And uh, and even though you know, as an AV installer and programmer and integrator, you know, we make a lot of money on installation and on pulling cable and there's markup on cables and all that. I do think that there's going to be some some pretty reliable wireless solutions. The ones that I've seen currently are kind of finicky. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking, to say the least, right? So right. I'm, I'm looking for something a little more stable. Uh, you know, I think expanded automation, you know, you're going to be able to control pretty much anything you want. Uh, and I'm also assuming that it's going to be very much like the Terminator. And, uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is just going to appear naked from a ball of light with a projector oh, under no, his arm no, and no, install no. it for you. That's right. He'll, he'll have a projector under his arm, and it's go time. Yes, but does he have to be naked? Well, that's just how it happened, man. I mean, I did. that's not something I want, but that's just how the Terminator appears. Okay, but to, Arnold Schwarzenegger 20 years ago naked would be one thing. Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. naked now? Not so much. Not so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good good point. But we'll see. I mean, or or like the Matrix style, you know, you jack in uh, there the we head, go. head jack, yeah, for a video conference. Can you imagine the bandwidth on something like that? Jeez, no. And, uh, and, and the scary thing is, I think Intel is absolutely brilliant hiring sci-fi writers for this because if you look at the history of science fiction and look at where we are now, technology-wise, just the things that have come out in my lifetime, and I'm not that old, thanks. You know, it, it's phenomenal <laughs> how much science fiction the fiction emphasis mm -hmm. has become our everyday reality and things that would blow people's mind in the in the 40s and 50s and even as recent as the 70s are just commonplace and you know kids today just pick up the ipad and go when when this was something that would just would would change people's lives back then it was viewed as something that was fiction mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I, i'm still waiting on the rocket car myself but for the most part rocket car aside the existing sci-fi authors have done a phenomenal job at predicting where we are today. So I, I, I just can't wait to read what these science fiction writers today are thinking about for the future, AV or otherwise. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you look at, at Star Trek, which is a, a huge one. Um, the, uh, the communicator is, is, in, you know, is, is in all of our pockets, for crying out loud. Actually, it's, it's a communicator on steroids. Right. You know. mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to give you guys mine and, and let you comment or, or poo-poo it. Um, I am looking forward to the day, and, and my, my friends at, at Switcher Manufacturers won't like this, uh, but cloud switching. Hmm. I, I would like to see a day where you have a wall plate and you plug in your, your, um, your DVD player or your computer, uh, whatever connector you want, HDMI, DisplayPort, I don't care. And the network itself takes care of it, so it, it encodes it there on, on at the wall plate. The display, whatever it is, projector, flat panel, OLED, um, then can and can pick it up, and you're you're telling that display that you're you want to go, you want to get the video from that IP address, and the wall plate has its own IP, and then it displays it. So you you can still handle content protection, you can still handle high def. Uh, but that's kind of what I'm what I'm seeing, and that's what I would like to see is is kind of what's called what I'm going to call cloud switching. I don't know. That, you just coined actually... that term. <laughs> <laughs> I just coined that term. I, I should patent it, huh? And I say, quick copyright that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a great concept. I think it will be a generation from now, simply because right now, and, and, and I'm talking tech generation, so you know, in a year or two. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, it won't be right now because. Even in the IT world, there are so many people still that are, you know, cloud is kind of amorphous and scary to a lot of people. And there's still a lot of skepticism, even though there are brilliant things happening on the cloud. I use cloud technology for a lot of things, but there's always still that, you know, can I have just a box that does this or a backup or a, you know, a hard something for real mm -hmm. if the cloud just quits Dies. working or vapors <laughs> off? Yeah, exactly. But I, I think it's a great, brilliant idea, you know, just not immediately. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to be shooting a package at Cedia about, you know, some of, my, uh, some of my letdowns about what I was told as a kid through movies and TV about what the future was going to be like through the Jetsons or Back <laughs> to the Future 2. You know, I'm waiting on my hoverboard, and uh, <laughs> I haven't even seen a prototype at this point. 
So, uh, so yeah, it's funny that this should come up. Um, and also, the singularity is right around the corner anyway, so we got nothing to worry about, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good night. Well, thank you both very much. Um, Dawn Mead, she is known as AV Dawn. She is a consultant, also part of the blog squad. She's been with us today. Dawn, anything you'd like to promote? Um, you mentioned, um, I'm going to make you promote something. <laughs> you, you mentioned the uh, AV chat. And uh, why don't you tell people, if they're not familiar, how they can get involved in the AV chat? AV chat is one of the most democratic things I've run across in our industry. It's not at all dependent on what in, what exactly you do in the industry. Everybody's welcome, even people not in the industry. Um, but basically, all you need is a Twitter account, and when you tweet, you use the hashtag AV chat. And once every other week, I think biweekly, we have a new topic that's moderated usually by Linda. AV writer, mm -hmm. we, we all use Twitter names, um, <laughs> or PK Audiovisual, which is Paul, I can't remember his last name. I think it's but There you go. Um, those two do a great job moderating. Each week we have a different topic. Um, yesterday's topic was a special bonus issue of AV Chat, so to speak, on Cedia. Um, the first Thursday in September, the topic is the economy and how we're dealing as mm -hmm. an industry. Um, and then the 15th of September, the topic is green AV, sort of an open mic on green and sustainable topics. Um, but Linda Frembies, I believe is how she pronounces it. I always get it wrong. Sorry, Linda, if it's wrong. But uh, she innovated AV chat as a thing. And it's been going on now for the better part of a year. Um, just hop onto Twitter the, every other Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time, and join in the conversation. Even if you just have nothing to say other than, hi, I'm here, say, hi, I'm here. We're, we're a friendly bunch of AV tweeps, and we'd love to have you. Excellent. Uh, also with us is Philip Cordell. Philip is and also known as Hi-Fi, the AV professional. It's the avprofessional.com uh, or at the underscore AV underscore pro on Twitter. Is that right, Philip? That's right. Well, I appreciate it. You ha you have fun with at Cedia. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm looking forward to Cedia, and uh, and here's a little something as we part, man. Hi, fi I stay fly like aviation. I'm catching up with folks here at AV Nation. Got to give a shout out to the AV Tweeps holding it down with Tim here on AV Week. Very nice. Very well nice. done. Nice, hey. my friend. That's for you. Um, also, be, uh, before he had to leave, uh, um, Rich Fergosa. Um, He's at R.A. Fergoza Electronic Interiors. He's known as R, um, at R. Fergoza, F-R-E-G-O-S-A. On Twitter, my name is Tim, uh, Tim Albright, uh, T.D. Albright, if you would like to follow me on on Twitter. Um, check out the website, avnation.tv. Um, anybody, the uh, a, a friend of mine, uh, Michael Drainer, who's on usually with me, uh, just put up a special on White Spaces. He had a conversation with uh, the folks at Sennheiser. Um, he just put that up a couple days ago, so check that out. And uh, thank you very much for listening to AV Week. Thank you guys very much. That's all the time we have for AV Week. Oh,